Hi everybody, welcome to the second Pro Photo webinar and I am Mark Wallace hanging out here and this is our model, this is Alexis Catherine and you might remember Morgan, he is going to be assisting me today and we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be doing specifically how to shoot on location and balancing ambient light which is this bright light we have behind us with uh, light from a flash. And so we've set this up intentionally in this really bad lighting condition. So on the video, you can see that we're sort of underexposed here, we're these dark people. And uh, behind us, we have a scene that's overexposed. And so this is a situation that you're going to be in a lot as a photographer, if you're shooting on location, doing weddings, portraiture, that type of stuff. And so you have to figure out how to do that. Now, maybe some of you have shot with speed lights uh, and have been able to do this with your high speed sync. But sometimes when you're shooting with studio strobes, specifically the Profoto B1, you have this issue called sync speed where you can't get your shutter speed fast enough to expose the ambient light properly, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're gonna cover all of that stuff in this webinar. But what we first want to do is to show you how the Profoto B1 works and how we can use the through the lens metering um, to make everything work and it's gonna be terrific. Now I wanna just sort of show you the setup that we have here. We are intentionally, because of all the cables and wires with our video cameras and the live streaming stuff and uh, sort of the logistics, now we are in this gorgeous backyard. In fact, we're gonna show you right now. Here's sort of the gorgeous backyard and I'm looking over here and we are in this very, very small space right here. And you can see we have this gorgeous background that we're gonna be using. Um, and wouldn't you know it today, if we plan to the sky, you can see that we have some scattered clouds in Phoenix, which is really, really rare. And so what we're getting is uh, where our light is changing on and off throughout the day. And so Paul, if you can keep going over to where the big clouds are over in that direction. That'd be great on the opposite direction. Yeah, the other way. Other way, yeah, there you go. So you can see that we actually have more clouds on the other side and that is giving us some, uh, some fun exposure issues. Anyway, so we are in this very, very small space and we're gonna try to do the entire demonstration in this space of about, I don't know, 20 by 20 feet, something like that. Now, normally, if we were shooting in a location, we wouldn't be restricted by all these cables in a live show, and so we'd have some flexibility. So some of you might be thinking, why is he shooting there? Why doesn't he just go over there and shoot? Well, because we gotta get video cameras and stuff over there, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Okay, um, before we start, I have to remember to tell you that um, we can ask questions. You can ask questions live, so if you are at profoto.com slash live, there is a chat window, not the social stream, the chat window. And in that chat window, you can type in questions and there are people from Profoto right now in the chat window and they are going to forward me some of those questions and I'll be answering some of those questions live. And so they'll probably take three or four questions that all seem the same and just send me one question and that's how that works. So you can see there is uh, that. And also uh, Twitter is on Profoto. I mean, Profoto is on Twitter and they're gonna be hanging out there for a while. Uh, afterwards as well. All right, um, we have that. And then also, if you want to uh, have any information about the Profoto B1, you can find that at uh, profoto.com slash B1. And so go there and check that out. It's pretty cool. And you can see all of that stuff. All right, and there's also a frequently asked questions section there. Well, let's get started. You guys want to be ready to get started? All right, so don't miss any out on any of that stuff. What I want to show you first is um, how the, the uh, Profoto works to get just an automatic exposure when balancing ambient light with light from a flash, and I'll explain some of that as well. So what we're gonna have uh, Lex do, um, she's gonna stand right here inside this overhang, inside this shadow, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my uh, Profoto B1 with no modifier, and we're just gonna turn it on, and so it's just on there, and then uh, I'm going to turn on my camera, and then to make sure that you can see everything I'm doing, I am tethering uh, to Lightroom here. So this is going to pop on here in a second, hopefully. Make sure we have our tethering started. And wouldn't you know it, there we go. It always happens when you go live that something doesn't connect exactly. And so here we go, we'll get our tethering started here. And is our camera not working? There it is. No camera detected. Of course, when it's live, the camera is not working, why not? Why not? Well, we have to figure this out. So uh, bear with me for just a second as we see why this isn't working. Cause we just shot this like 30 seconds ago and it worked just great. There it is, Whew. All right, it, they, it wasn't plugged in or something. Okay, it's working, no big deal. All right, so now we have this connected here. And what we're going to do is as I'm shooting, you can see everything that's working. 
and so everything's all up to, up to snuff. So to start with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just turn my camera on and I'm putting it in shutter priority mode. So I'm turning my camera on, it's in shutter priority mode, that's TV, that I, means I can set the shutter speed, my camera's gonna set the exposure. The reason I'm doing that is because of this thing called sync speed, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, we're gonna do that, and then I'm using uh, my Profoto Air Remote to control my Profoto B1, and it's all automatic, and so I've set my shutter speed at 200, and then I'm going to have this a little bit more on axis, and then what I wanna do here is just take a shot of Alexis, Beautiful. All right, so we have this shot. It's going to come up here. I'll make this full screen so you can see it. And here it is. So we have this shot of Alexis, and we have this uh, ambient light that is nice, shallow depth of field. It was shot at 2.8, and we have Alexis here that's exposed properly. It looks all good. Now, the question is um, what if we want to control these things separately? So the light from the flash and the ambient light. So let me explain what's happening here. We have two different sources of light when we're shooting in a situation like this. And it's important to understand these two things because you can control them separately. So first, let me show you what happens when I uh, turn off my flash. I'm just going to shoot with no flash. And what I'm going to do also, I'm going to put my camera in manual mode because I want to have more control over what's happening. And again, I'm going to get to this as we go along. But what I'm trying to under, uh, help you understand right now is the difference between light that we can't control, um, we can't turn it on and off or make it brighter or darker. That's all the ambient light. The difference between that and the light that we can control from the flash. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to point my camera at the background and I'm going to set my exposure using my uh, through the lens metering. So I'm going to look through here. My shutter speed is at 200 and my aperture is at 6.3. And I'm going to take a photo of Lex here. And what we're going to see is the problem that you will have when you're shooting without a flash. You have a correct exposure on the background, but we have a silhouetted person. So that's no good. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to add a flash to that. And so what I'll do is I'll just turn on my flash. And because the B1 uses through the lens metering, and if you don't understand that, watch the very first webinar that we did um, last month, and it'll explain all that. Since this uses through the lens metering, all I have to do now is still in manual mode on my camera. I'll just take a picture and look at this. This is so cool. No meter required at all. That's the first picture we took. Here is the second picture we took. Boom. The flash figures out the exposure. The camera figures out the exposure, tells the flash, and we get a great exposure. Now, what we want to do, though, is how do we control these two things separately? Well, um, to control the ambient light, we control it just like we always did before. We use our aperture values and our shutter speeds to make the light either more or less exposed. So for example, let's say I want that background to be darker. Well, I can't make my shutter speed any faster, and I'm going to explain that in a second, but what I can do is I can make my aperture value smaller. So I'm going to intentionally make my aperture value smaller, and that's going to underexpose the ambient light. But because the flash is a different exposure, the uh, exposure on Lex is going to stay the same. So I'm going to crank this up to about f13, and that is going to underexpose the background. And so I will take the same shot again. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you these two shots side by side so you can see the difference between the first and second shot. So if I take this first shot, and I'll take the second shot, and I'm even going to take the very, very first shot that we did here. I'm going to show you these side by side. And what you can see is the very, very first shot where we just let the camera figure everything out, we actually have an overexposed background um, because the camera was trying to average everything out. So that's why I went to manual mode because I wanted to have more control. So if we get rid of this one and we look at these two, look how much different that background is on the second shot than it is on the first shot. The second shot has uh, a darker background than the first one. And if you look at Lex, she has the same exposure on both pictures. And so what we have are two different exposures that we can control independently, and it works really, really simply. And so when you're shooting on location, what I try to do um, almost always is the first thing I'm looking to do is to uh, figure out the ambient light, the stuff that I can't change, and solve the issues there. So the way that we did uh, solving some issues here is we got Lex into the shade 
and putting her in the shade gave her a nice soft light and made her much darker than the background and that allows me then to use a flash to do some uh, control of the light on her instead of having to compete with that really really bright background and having light coming in from the sun. But we're going to show you how to do that as well. Um, but before we get going too much farther what I want to do is I want to see if we have any questions and if we do I'll answer those. If we don't I need to explain to you sync speed because everything we're going to be doing today really depends on this thing about sync speed. So, all right, so first let me answer a few questions that are rolling in. They're already coming in. Um, so the first one is, can you use this B1 with the D1 together? So yeah, so the B1 has a battery built into the side. The D1 is actually something you have to plug into either a wall outlet or you can use a portable power pack um, to power on location. You can use them together, absolutely. The difference though is the D1 doesn't have through the lens metering. It doesn't have TTL metering and so you have to do everything manually. With the B1 it's got built-in metering. You can use it and you don't need a light meter. The camera can control it. So you can use them together but they both have to be used in full manual mode when you do that or um, you can use the B1 in, in uh, TTL mode but you have to control the D1 in manual mode to, ex to control the exposure of that. So yeah you absolutely can. They just don't behave the same. Um, so that works. So why is the 5D Mark III limited to a sync speed of 1 200th of a second? Well, we're going to talk about sync speed. Um, some 5D Mark III's actually have a sync speed of about 160 to be safe, but we haven't gotten to sync speed yet. Why is it limited to that? Well, it's physics. And so because of the size of the shutter and uh, the cost of the camera and how it's manufactured, all that kind of stuff, that's the limit. And most cameras, most DSLR cameras, have a sync speed of about 200, but we haven't even talked about sync speed yet, so we'll come back to that. Um, does the B1 support high speed sync? Um, not currently. So the B1 does not have high speed sync for getting uh, shutter speeds above sync speed. Um, but there are some future updates coming and so um, those are features that are planned uh, potentially for 2014 this year later in the year. So um, we need to understand sync speed though because a lot of questions are coming in about sync speed and I'm talking about sync speed. What the heck is it? Well, sync speed is something that happens in your camera and it's based on how the shutters work. So you have two shutters. You have a first curtain and a second curtain. They open and close in a very certain way. And to understand all of this, instead of me explaining it with my hands, we're just going to show you an animation. So Matt, roll that animation and let's talk about sync speed. It's important to understand how your camera's shutter works. Your camera's shutter has two curtains and these curtains have names. The first curtain and the second curtain. They open and close to reveal light to the sensor, much like a curtain opens and closes in a theater to reveal what's happening on the stage. Let's take a closer look. When you press the shutter release with your finger, it tells the camera to open the shutter. The first curtain opens to reveal the light to the camera's sensor. Then the second curtain follows behind to hide the light. Then the curtains reset and wait for you to press the shutter release again. Let's watch that again. Notice in this animation that the first curtain opens completely before the second curtain begins to follow. This only happens at slower shutter speeds, usually speeds under 200th of a second. Now watch what happens when we speed things up. When the shutter speed is faster, the second curtain can't wait for the first curtain to open all the way. If it does, it won't make it across in time. Notice in this animation that the shutter is never fully open. It just reveals a slit of light as it travels across the sensor. And the slit becomes smaller as the shutter speed increases. Sync speed is the shutter speed on your camera that allows the first curtain to fully open before the second curtain begins to follow. In other words, it's the fastest shutter speed you can use with a flash. Let's take another look at your camera's shutter this time with a flash in the mix. When your camera's shutter speed is set to sync speed or slower, a few things happen. When you push the shutter release button, the first curtain opens, and as soon as the first curtain is fully open, the flash fires. Then the second curtain closes. Normally, if we have our shutter speed set too high, we'd have problems. Let's take a look. When you press the shutter release, the first curtain will begin to open, but before it's fully open, the second curtain begins to close. When the first curtain is fully open, the flash fires just like it did before. 
but this time, part of the sensor is covered by the second curtain. This will cause our photo to have a black area, and the faster your shutter speed, the more black you'll have in your photo. Okay, so um, that is sync speed, and you can see that when you're using a studio strobe, you have this limitation of about one two hundredth of a second with most cameras. Um, I think the 5D Mark II and some other cameras might be 160. There are some cameras that I've seen, the Nikon D3S and D3X, I think are 250 around that. But to stay safe, we're going to stay around two hundredth of a second. And so that causes some unique challenges when you're trying to balance ambient light with light from a flash. Specifically, what if you want to uh, shoot with a really wide open aperture? How do you do that without high speed sync? And high speed sync is this thing that allows you to shoot with faster shutter speeds. Well, we don't have that, so we need to figure that out. Well, we're gonna get there, but before we do, I wanna show you first how we can use our B1 as a simple fill flash. And then I wanna show you how we can use the B1 as the key light when we're shooting in ambient light. Now what I've done is we've moved Lex back here to crazy bright light. And so the shadow, the sun has sort of come out from behind the clouds and you can see that now she is melting in the sun. And what we wanna do is figure out, well, how do we balance these two things? Because we have this light from the flash, we've got this really bright sun back here. How do we figure this out? Well, here are the steps that I recommend. So when you have your camera, the first thing you want to do is you have to, to uh, get the light or you have to expose correctly for the light that you can't change. And so that light is the ambient light. And so the way I do this is I will point my lens to the background. So not to the thing that I'm illuminating with my flash, but to the thing that I can't control. And I'll set my shutter speed at sync speed, which is 200th of a second, that's where I am. And then I'm gonna roll my aperture until my light meter tells me I have a proper exposure on the background. So I'm gonna do that right now. So I'm pointing this back to these trees here, and that gives me a reading of F10. And just to show that that works, I'm going to turn off my flash really fast. I'm just gonna take a picture of the background, and you can see here uh, when it comes in, we have a properly exposed background. Here it is, there it is. So that's the properly exposed background. Now what we want to do is we need to get this flash to have a proper exposure at F10. How do we do that? Well, in the olden days, if we had like a D1 or some other uh, manual studio strobe, what we'd have to do is use a light meter and we'd have to keep metering and adjusting the light until this metered at F10. But we don't need to do that because this uses TTL metering and so it's just gonna do it automatically. And to prove it, we're just gonna do it. And we've added, by the way, a beauty dish to this because I want to soften the light a bit. Now what we have, I don't know, Lance, if you can zoom in on Lex's face here, but we've got a bunch of shadows that are sort of coming, and maybe you can move your head this way. There we go. I'm sorry, this way. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of shadows coming across her face that are just not very pleasing, right? So we wanna to try to fill those shadows in. So what I'm going to do here, we'll zoom back out, is I'm just using my uh, beauty dish here as a fill light. I'm just gonna to try to soften the shadows. And so this is just filling stuff in. And so what I've done is I've turned on my uh, Profoto B1. It's in full TTL mode. And I just sort of put it to the side there. I'm not metering the light, which is sort of awesome. And I already have my exposure set. I'm gonna take a shot. Ah, Lex loves that because it's so bright. Let's take a look at what we have here. So when this shot comes in, you can see that we've sort of softened these shadows here. Um, they're not gone, but we've softened those just a bit. And what I could do is I can uh, use exposure or flash exposure compensation to kick up my fill light. So I'm gonna do that really fast. I'm gonna take my flash exposure compensation on my uh, camera, and I'm gonna increase that by one stop. And that's gonna make this much brighter. That's probably too much. I'm gonna do it, uh, let's say, two thirds of a stop. And we'll take another shot here. So we're just trying to eliminate some of the shadows. They're not gonna go away completely, but we're just trying to eliminate some of those. So when this comes in, you'll see that uh, we have some of those shadows that are a little bit, a little bit less on this side, but they're still there. And so um, sometimes when you're using a, uh, a light like this as a fill, it works okay, but sometimes what you wanna do is you wanna use it as the key, in other words, as the main source of light. And so this is a misnomer. What people uh, will say at this point is, we need to overpower the sun, right? Overpower the sun. 
Well, that's really not the way it works. What you really need to do is underexpose the sun. That's what we really need to do is underexpose the sun. So what I'm going to do here, and we're also going to show you some other things that you should do when you're shooting in ambient light. This is the, the wrong way to do it, uh, the way we're doing it right now. So if we're just using it as a fill light, we might be able to diminish some of the shadows, but we really want to control and shape the light and make it beautiful. So first, let me show you uh, the first step, and that is I want to underexpose the ambient light. How do I do that? Well, we know that it was exposed correctly at 200th of a second at f10. Now the light has shifted a little bit with the clouds. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just keep shrinking our aperture value and so that we underexpose that. So again, I'm going to look at the background. And to underexpose by about two stops, we're at f16. So now I'm going to take a picture. This is going to adjust so it's more powerful. So it's shooting at f16. And then what we'll get is we'll get a shot on Lex where this is the main light and the background is underexposed. So we'll do that. I'm going to move this in just a little bit and Lex look right at me. Beautiful. Boom. Now look what we have here. We have a shot where we took all those shadows and we have not totally eliminated them, but they're much, much uh, less noticeable and the background is darker. Well, that's still not good enough in my book. We still have some work to do to get this to work correctly. And so let's start shaping this light here. Um, but before we do that, let me review what we did. To, to uh, balance the light, first I said, what is the ambient light? And I set my exposure to that. And then I allowed the through the lens metering to adjust the power of my flash to make sure that it matched that ambient light. And that's how that works. It's really, really simple. And now what we're trying to do is make this look more pleasing because it doesn't look very pleasing right now. We have some shadows that are sort of across Lex's face and it's not great. So before I go on, I want to just make sure that I'm not losing everybody on this demo because we need to start fixing this ambient light and we can do that. Um, so let's see. Um, all right, so does the uh, TTL, does TTL work with neutral density filters? It does. We're going to use a neutral density filter here in a bit. Does the B1 take light modifiers from the D1 line? Yes. So one thing that's important to understand is any Profoto light, D1, a B1, an Acute, Acute 2, the Pro 7s, the Pro 7Bs, the Pro 8s, any of the Profoto heads, it doesn't matter which ones you use, all of the light modifiers work on any Profoto head. So they're all the exact same size. And so I could take this beauty dish and put it on any uh, of the uh, Profoto lights that I own, and it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, so the B1 uses all the same uh, light. Okay, um, can you please address if pocket wizards can be used with B1 for Nikon right now? Absolutely. So the B1, it can work in full manual mode just like a D1, except for it's got a battery. And so you can use it in full manual mode, and it does everything that the D1 does um, and more. So yes, you can use a pocket wizard on the B1, no problem. You're just not going to get any TTL metering. It's just manual. So if you're on a Nikon, no TTL yet. Um, all right, what metering? So people want to know what metering am I using in the camera? So I'm using um, evaluative metering, or if you're uh, a Nikon person, it's called matrix metering. So evaluative metering is what I'm using. I'm not using spot metering. OK, and let me make sure I have all the questions answered. OK, yeah, so evaluative metering. And normally, if you're using speed lights, and if you've been using speed lights in the past, evaluative metering is what they default to um, for Canon. So that's the metering that you probably are used to. OK, let's get back to this. Because what we've done here is we've, we've tried to sort of overpower the sun, and we've done some things to, to expose this. But here's the best way to do this. Instead of if you're in a situation where you have this really nasty light like this, um, you can try all day to just get so much light blah, on your model and underexpose the background to try to get something that's, that's really terrific. That can work. But the best thing to do is to try to shape the light uh, that you're in, this ambient light. And so what I would suggest is if you have uh, uh, some shadow or some shade, get into the shade first. But what if you don't? Well, what you need to do is you need to create some shade. Well, guess what we have? We have this big umbrella right here. So we're going to steal it. And so Morgan, I want you to steal that. And Morgan's going to go over here, and he's going to block this, this light. There you go. And make sure, yeah. There we go. Good. So if you don't have a Morgan, maybe I'm going to start calling you Captain Morgan. All right. Now what we've done is, and you can't see because I've put this right here. 
there we go, is we've put Lex in the shade. And so now we have this really dark underexposed Lex and we can shape the light any way we want. And that background we can start working with separately. So first let's start shaping the light on Lex in the shade. Now, uh, obviously you, don't, you might not have an umbrella like this to carry around, but good news, Profoto makes all kinds of light modifiers, including these big flags that you can get to hold up and uh, diffusion panels and things like that. So there are all kinds of choices for you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to take this and I want this to be pleasing. So instead of having it to the side like we did before, I've got this on a little boom. I'm gonna move this out about like that. And we're gonna raise it up, raise it up. Like a good child, raise it up. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna get this to about right here. All right, how's that look? Looks good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, now we have Lex in shade and we have Morgan holding that. How's it going, Morgan? Still good? He's strong, he can do it. All right, so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna point my camera to the background and we are going to check there to see what the exposure is and it should be at about F10 now and we're gonna let our B1 head figure out the exposure. I need to raise it up just a little bit more. It's in the shot. It's always fun working on location. Always a good time. All right, raise that up just a little bit. And now let's try again. So Lex, look right at me. Beautiful, perfect. Okay, now let's take a look at this shot because it is much more pleasing, I think much more pleasing. We've got a tree growing out of the back of our head. I need to fix that. But you can see that now we've shaped the light. It's much softer. That sh uh, shadow underneath her chin is much, much softer. We don't have the side light that we had before. We've got this nice, soft beauty dish light. Um, and the background is okay. It's not terrific because what I prefer is to have more shallow depth of field. So I want to open my aperture a little bit wider. But right now we've got this sink speed issue that's fighting with us. Um, and we have to be able to figure out how to fix that. But let's review the progress we've made so far. Number one, use your camera pointed at the background, dial in your exposure so that the background is properly exposed, and then let the B1 figure out using through the lens metering how to fill in the flash or be the key light. And if you have to, block some of that light so that you have uh, a greater ability to control the light that's falling on your subject itself. Okay, so that's what we would normally do. But now the question is, how do you get your aperture to open wide up? So the way that you do that, and this is something that I recommend highly. Somebody asked this originally, and that is, can I use the, the, uh, the TTL with the neutral density filter? So what I have here, I'm gonna put this on my camera, this is a variable neutral density filter. And let's see, Paul, if you can see this. And what this does is as I rotate it, this gets darker and lighter. Does that work? Yeah. It's pretty cool. Okay, so what this does is when I put it on my lens, um, I'm basically putting sunglasses on my lens. And so when you have your shutter speed set at 200 and you can't make it any faster, you have to be able to... Uh, limit how much light is coming into your camera in some way so that you can open up your aperture. And the way to do that is to use a neutral density filter. And I use a variable neutral density filter. And what that means is neutral density filters are usually sold in third stop, one stop, two stop, four stop, different uh, settings. With this one, I, I only have one. What that allows me to do is to set my shutter speed at 200 in manual mode set my aperture value at 2.8 in manual mode. And then what I do is I just rotate this uh, neutral density filter until I see that my exposure is correct. And once it's correct, then I can shoot. Now we're gonna have an issue with this, but let's, let's walk through it first. So the first thing I'm gonna do, just like I did before, I'm going to um, first set my aperture value at 2.8 because I wanna have a wide open aperture. I'm gonna point this at the background and then I'm going to rotate my neutral density filter until I get an exposure that's correct. And so that's about, oh, it's a few stops. And that's what that is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a photo of Lex. 
look right at me, Lex? Beautiful. I'm going to move this so we don't have a tree growing out of your head. OK, now the issue that we have here, and this is something that, that Canon struggles with a little bit. With this neutral density filter, what's happening is we're getting an exposure that's a little bit underexposed from the flash. Um, and so what I can do, it's very, very simple, is I will go into my flash exposure compensation, and I'm going to boost that by about two stops. And this is the beauty of the B1. I can control my flash from my camera. How do I know it's a two stop difference? Well, because before we started, I was playing with it a little bit and figured it out just by trial and error. Um, and so that's what I can do. So let's take that same shot once again. I'm at 2.8. I've got Lex over here. She looks great. Getting a little bit too much Morgan in the shot. Don't want Morgan in the shot. All right, now what we can have, take a look at this. We have a shot now that has very, very shallow depth of field. Here it comes. There you go. Um, it's showing up. There we go. All right, now we have very shallow depth of field, and we have Lex properly exposed using a light modifier, which is really terrific. And that's how that works. And we can do that um, all day long. It's really, really nice. And because the B1 is pretty powerful, we've got enough punch to work in bright conditions. In fact, what we're going to do, Morgan, is let's have you put that umbrella away. Let's try some of this. We're going to try this without the shade, because I know a lot of people are like, wait, can I overpower the light? You can. So I want to do that. First, I want to check to see if we have any questions coming in, because I know that we probably do. OK. Let's see. All right, question eight. Question nine. Question seven. Okay. So one of the question is, does the B1 use the Canon transmitters or does it need its own transmitter? So Canon has some radio triggers that they came out with a couple years ago. And the answer is no. It needs the air remote trigger from Profoto. Um, so uh, that's for manual only. Or you can use the air remote TTLC, which is what I'm using. And that gives you um, the through the lens metering. So if you want to use through the lens metering or the air remote that's built in, you need to use the Profoto air remote or the air remote TTLC. That will give you that. So it will not work with the Canon transmitters. They have totally different um, languages. In other words, one's on one frequency, one is on the other. It's, it won't work. This won't work. All right. The other one is um, why in high speed sync uh, don't you have black bars? So if we go back to that, um, and this is really important to understand the difference between a studio strobe using that in really bright light like we have right now and using high speed sync. So if you have high speed sync, what's happening is the, the shutters are opening like the little animation should, where the first shutter starts to open, or the first uh, curtain starts to open, the second one starts to follow. But the flash doesn't just fire once. That's not what happens. So what happens is your speed light when the first curtain opens, the flash fires. And this happens super fast. It fires. And then as the curtains move, it fires again and again and again and again. And it's a strobe. And so it's firing over and over and over as those things are going. Yeah. So as that's going up and down like that, we are getting multiple fires of a flash. It's going doo 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 And so that's how a speed light allows you to shoot faster than the sync speed of your camera. The penalty of that, though, is because the speed light is firing so fast and for so long, A, you, don't, you can't freeze action using high speed sync um, with the flash. You're using the shutter to, to freeze action. So that goes away. The second thing that goes away is the, the power of your flash decreases dramatically. And so if you're using high speed sync and you add, let's say, a soft box or a beauty dish or an umbrella, you have to have that soft box or umbrella so close to your subject you really don't have a lot of options. And if you're trying to shoot in really bright light like this, you'll have to combine two or three or four uh, speed lights to get enough power to use any kind of light modifier. And so it gets to be, and also your batteries, oof, they'll die really, really quickly. And so anybody that shot with speed lights using high speed sync knows they overheat fast and your batteries die really quickly and you have to be really close to your subject and you're limited with your light modifiers. So no black bars, faster than sync speed, but those are the penalties that you get. The B1 is the equivalent of about 10 speed lights, something like that. Um, and so you have uh, a lot more power 
which allows you to use neutral density filters or use larger soft boxes and things like that to get some spectacular light. And so that's the benefit of having the B1. Okay, that was a long answer to that question, but it's important to understand that high speed sync is terrific, but it comes at a cost of, um, of a lot of things. All right, there's another question here that says, does the variable ND filter affect the quality of the image? The answer is no. So a neutral density filter is called neutral because it doesn't affect any of the colors. It just makes the, the light um, like sunglasses. It just makes things darker in an even, uniform way. And so with a variable uh, neutral density filter, there is something that is a penalty, um, and it's really technical, but I'll tell you about it. It's using a technique called cross-polarization. So you have two different plates of glass that are polarized, and so by moving one over the other, that's how it's making things darker. And so at some aperture values and at some focal lengths, when you have two polarized pieces of glass, what you'll get is this, um, uh, it looks like a, a cross. It's a little glare that will show up on full-size images, and so it's sort of this weird um, thing that, that shows up. It's sort of like a moray pattern if you have pinstripe shirts, something like that. And so uh, on some lenses and some filters, you will have a, a problem when you're at the very darkest end of your neutral density filter because of the cross-polarization stuff. If you're using a standard uh, ND filter um, with no cross-polarization, then you won't have that at all which is really terrific. So there is a gotcha with a, a variable neutral density filter, but I almost never get to that really, really dark side of the neutral density filter, and so I've never actually seen that show up. And if you buy high quality neutral density filters, you're not gonna see that either. Okay, this is a lot more technical than I thought it was gonna be today, it's really cool. All right, so what we're we gonna do, we're gonna over, are you melted yet? <laughs> Poor Lex is back there like crying because the sun is so bright. All right, so what we're gonna do here, can I get a standard reflector please? is we are going to uh, try to do the thing, we're going to do the thing that so many people want to do, which is overpower the sun, right? Can we overpower the sun, even though that's the wrong term for it? We're gonna do that. So what we're gonna do here is I'm changing out my uh, beauty dish here with the standard reflector because I wanna get as much punch as possible. And so what I'll show you is this is a, a standard Profoto reflector and it's got a shape that's similar to a parabolic um, reflector, which means that it, it gathers all the light that's coming out and it shoots it boom, straight out. And you can zoom this in and out. And so what that allows you to do is to get more or less light out of this. And so it changes the pattern of light from a wide angle to a narrow beam. And so when I put that in there, it really, really packs a punch. In fact, we um, did some tests on Adorama TV, um, oh, I don't know, two or three years ago and we tested out these reflectors and reflectors of other brands. And what we found is on a Profoto head at, um, I think we tested 1200 watt second heads, we found that the, this reflector allowed the Profoto heads to get one stop power more than any other brand, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's twice as much light, twice as much light. So the same amount of watt seconds, double the light using this reflector. So I'm using this, it's going to be harder light and so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put it on axis with my camera to get sort of a ring flash type effect. And so what we're gonna get is we're gonna get a small, um, sort of this small shadow underneath Lex's face, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna shape this light the way we want it. The other thing I'm gonna do here is, make sure we sort of put this out. So um, Lance, if you can zoom in on Lex here, I wanna show you a couple of other things that we would do here in uh, really bright light where we don't have control over, there we go. So you can see the shadows coming across her neck here. And so I'm gonna move you around, is that right? So if we move Lex this way, then we have a totally different shadow. If I move her this way, then uh, what we're doing, I'm getting hit. What we're doing is we have no shadow there. We just have shadow on this, or shadow on this side of her face. And so just by moving her face around, we can sort of control the kind of stuff we're getting. And maybe Morgan, you can, wind that down so I'm not hitting my head on it all over and over. So I can change the position of her body to change how we're um, lighting this. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we are going to have you, after that gets rolled down, <laughs> Morgan's being a sport. We're gonna have you, let me stand you right over here like that, there we go. Okay, so I'm just trying to position her in a place that, um, that works for me. And then I'm going to take this light and I'm going to position it so it is right, just hitting her directly in the face. 
which I've been told by models is not so fun because it's really bright. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly the same thing that I said before. And I'm going to, uh, I want to shoot at 2.8. So we're, we don't have her in the shade at all. So I'm going to point my camera at the background again to see what that exposure is. And it's dialed in perfectly. And if you're wondering, why do I keep doing that over and over since I did it once? Remember, we have clouds. And so as those clouds are coming over the, the sky, it's changing the exposure. So then what I'm going to do here is we are going to just shoot with nothing but this light right here. And let's take a look and see what we got. And I need to change my color temperature just a bit. But you can see here that when you're trying to overpower the sun totally, you're still going to get these sort of shadows here. So what I really need to do is I need to underexpose that background, that light. So I'm going to really dial this in, really dial it in there. There we go. So now my light is underexposed by about three stops. And now, Lex, let's take a shot. So Lex, turn your head this way just a little bit. Actually, I'm going to come on this side. Come this way with your head. There you go. There you go. It's rolling away. It's rolling away. All right. Good. There we go. Excellent. Pow. Okay, so this, what I did is this is the over the power of the sun shot that everybody wants to see. There it is. So I even, I way overpowered the sun. So I can start backing off my neutral density filter to bring back in that background. But you can see what I did is I've eliminated all those, sh those shadows from the sun. Did you move that? No, okay. So I need to move. So I'm going to open up my neutral density filter just a bit. But when I do that, it's going to bring back in some of that problem, some of those problems we had from the, the sun. But that's how you do it. That's how you overpower the sun. So here's the next shot here. This is the overpowering the sun. Wide open aperture, we shot this with 2.8. I can show you that. So this was shot, here it is, there it is. 200th of a second at 2.8 in full sunlight with a studio strobe. And we were able to, to, to do that. Now you're gonna have those shadow problems um, if you shoot in the middle of the day like we did right now. You're, you're gonna have those. And so the thing to do is you need to soften that light using an umbrella or something. In fact, let's go grab that diffusion panel that we had earlier. So um, Morgan's gonna do that, and we'll sort of show you how to do that. Then the next thing we're gonna do, just to sort of show you the power that this guy has, is we're gonna use a four by six softbox. But let me make sure I don't have any other questions coming in here. All right, so the last one is this. Can you talk a little bit about the batteries on the B1? How long do they take to charge? How many shots per charge? and how many cycles Profoto expects a user to get, and can you pull the battery out of the head? So yeah, I'll show you that. So um, on the quick charger, it takes about an hour to charge, and if you have a standard charger, it takes about two hours to charge. And also they have, um, uh, with the battery, a car charger that you can plug in, this is really cool. So if you're shooting on location, you have a cigarette lighter adapter, just boom, stick it in there. At full power, so we haven't shot anything at full power, I think, today. So. At full power, you get about 220 shots. Um, and then in normal conditions, you get hundreds and hundreds of shots. And uh, I think, I don't, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think uh, I, I misread it the last time. Let's see if it's there. But I think it said, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, I don't want to say the wrong thing. But I think in the lowest power setting, you can, you can expect to get like 50,000 flashes. It's something insane like that. So maybe I misquoted, but it's in the tens of thousands of flashes that you can get. And we didn't, we're not going to share this today, but this thing recycles extremely fast. If you're shooting action and stuff, you can shoot with um, you know, really, really fast. So yeah, let me show you how you can take this light out actually. So I've got a spare battery right over here and let's say we're in the middle of a shoot and oh no, the battery died. So this battery isn't dead, but let's just say it is. I can just slap a new battery in just like that. Turn it on. And then I'm gonna just take another picture. So here we go. One more shot, and don't put that up just yet, yet. And there we go. I just took the battery out, threw a new battery on, turned on the flash, and took a shot. And here comes the new shot that came in. So yeah, there's the shot. So, um, and I wasn't on the right axis for that to work, but you can see that the batteries are so easy to replace. They work really, really great. All right, let's keep going. Um, I want to show you a couple more tricks because we're almost out of time here. 
Um, oh, one more. What stand and boom arm combo am I using? And what uh, would it be good to know what is tough enough to handle it? So yeah, this, and I swear by these, this is a Matthews Baby Junior Triple Riser. The brand is Matthews, and this is a triple riser, one, two, three risers, and it's a Baby Junior. That's the, uh, the size of the stud that allows this to work. And then this is just a grip arm that you can buy with that. And so that's what I'm using. So it's all made by Matthews. So MSE, Matthews Studio Equipment. So I think it's msegrip.com. Um, but Matthews is the stand, and you can abuse them. They're really heavy duty, and that's what I use. Okay, so the other thing you can do if you don't have shade is you can use a translucent material. So let's just throw that up, and yeah, awesome. So that is going to, again, give us some softer look, and instead of using this very, very hard light right here, I'm going to throw up a beauty dish on this guy right here. I love the beauty dish. If you can't tell, beauty dish is my favorite. It's awesome. And I was going to shoot with some umbrellas today, but um, I got to be honest with you, I left them at the studio. So I got in trouble for that. So I apologize to everybody, but I, I blew it. I left my umbrellas at the studio. So we're using a beauty dish. So there's my little arm there. I'm going to raise this up, bring this in. There we go. Good. All right. So same thing, except for now we're diffusing that light just a bit and let's shoot again and this is a little bit more side light here beautiful poof cool check this out i like this here it is another shot coming in whammo and so again we're doing the whole overpower the ambient light overpower the sun to get some nice shots and we can play with our exposure on Lex using our exposure flash exposure compensation to do different things the other thing I want to do here just to sort of show you the benefits let's get that 4x6 softbox out what if we wanted to do something that was um, more than just a face shot which is what I want to do I'm gonna have you move into the shade just a bit <laughs> your eyes crying there you go um, one of my first um, suggestions for anybody shooting on location is get some modifiers to, to put your subject in shade so you can control that light. So what we're gonna do here, and I hope we don't block everybody, all of our cameras here. Morgan, we're gonna come and we're gonna put it on this side. I just wanna show you the kind of power that you can get. This is a four by six softbox. It's, it's large. So we're gonna put this on here. Ah, keep going. Are we hitting that? Nope. There we go, right there. Lock that on. Okay, let me lock this down. Perfect. Okay, we have a four by six softbox here, which if you ever wanted to shoot this with a speed light, forget it. And I'm gonna have to go right where you are. All right, here we go. I'm gonna take this guy here, I'm gonna move it over. Ah. I'm working in such a confined space, it's awesome. There we go. Okay. All right, can you guys see anything? Might have to move a little bit. All right, you're right there. Good. All right, so this softbox is big. It's very, very large. And so what I want to do is shoot, again, um, a nice environmental portrait. And we'll see what we can do. This is going to really push the boundaries of our flash because we have this very, very large light modifier. And so, Lex, what I want you to do is, is go that way just a hair. There you go. Just like that. Not quite that much. Come back just a hair. There you go. Give me a nice big smile. Now what I have in the background is I've got all these trees just coming out of the back of her head. And so uh, I would normally spend a little bit more time to, to position her where I didn't have this horrible thing coming out of her head. But take a look. We have this shot that we shot with the studio strobe and we're shooting at 2.8 in normal light conditions and we've got this nice environmental portrait. Now the cool thing is if we want more of that background, I can easily do that by opening uh, or closing down my aperture a little bit. So let's have you step back just a little bit. Let's say, oh, sorry, not that much. Too far. Let me bring this back a little bit. There we go. I want to see if I can get a little bit more of the background. So what I'm going to do is instead of shooting at 2.8, I'm going to shoot at uh, 4.5, maybe 5.0. Oh. There we go. Uh, like that, I'll do a horizontal shot. Let's have you cross your arms. 
Yeah, like, and then take a half step forward. So you're, there you go. Beautiful. Good. Good, good, good. Now what we're seeing is we're getting much more of the background in focus. So it's not quite as shallow. And so now what we have is we need to fill in on the other side some of that light. And so we can do that. So Morgan, I want you to come over and there's the reflector underneath in that black thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring out a silver reflector. It's in the black pouch, in the black pouch, at the very bottom. There we go. So just bring that over here and I'll show them. So this is a, a Profoto reflector. Um, it's awesome. It comes out like this and you go shwabang. So what we're going to have you do, Morgan, is we're going to have you go on the opposite side of the softbox. I'm just going to have you hold this up and I'll tell you how close to get. It's got handles on it. All right, we're going to do that to fill in. We're going to try the white side and then we'll try the, 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 uh, the uh, silver side. So you're going to have to go this way and your body's going to have to go that way. There you go. There you go. Perfect. And Morgan, step back just a hair. There you go. And then do your arms like that. There you go. Like you didn't clean the background. There you go. Cool. And then flip that over to the silver side. And we're going to do this one more time. And last shot. There you go. Excellent. Okay. So we can use this guy to start filling in light. We can also add a second light. So we got a little bit softer light. There we go. The silver looks much better. And so what we're able to do is with a little bit of styling and a little bit of, um, you know, some, some props and maybe a little bit more space where we don't have a bunch of cameras to sit around. We have this shot where we have Lex clearly separated from the background with this nice shallow depth of field. We can see the background is, you know, a pool and some uh, patio stuff. We have nice shaped light. So we don't have that really, really hard light that was on her. And we did it all with one light, battery powered on location, which is really, really cool. All right, so let me just check because we have just enough time for a few questions. Okay, the last question is this, what was the setting on the B1 for the softbox shots? How much power? And the answer is, I don't know, because it's the, the camera is, is um, controlling that. And so I'm never setting the power of that. It's all happening automatically. So I'll take a look. So it was at full power. So it was at 10. So 500 watt seconds full power is what it was using to fill that soft box. And so, yeah, that's the actual thing. Awesome shot. That looks like a beautiful, that's a beautiful shot right there. That's awesome. Like product photography, that's an awesome shot. Anyway, way to go, Paul. He's our camera guy right there. Um, so that's what it was. It was at full blast, which means if you had speed lights and you wanted to do this, you would have to have a bracket of, I don't know, 10 speed lights in there to do the same thing. It's, it's crazy. The other thing we could do, which I didn't do, is we have another B1 that we just didn't set up yet. It's just sort of on the other side. We could use that as the fill light, or we could use it as a kicker light. We could do all kinds of things and control those separately, and it works just the same. So it works really, really well. And you're probably not going to be doing um, 4 by 6 softbox stuff at noon in Phoenix. Normally, we said this this morning when we were setting up at 7 in the morning, we're like, we should have done this at golden hour when the sun was coming up where normal sane photographers do all this stuff. We did this at the absolute worst time in Phoenix, which is high noon. It's, it's just almost exactly noon. Okay, so um, another question is, it's coming in here, so I'm going to wait for this as it's coming in here. So when can I use my 1DX with a B1? in TTL. So that's the question. When, so there's a bunch of people with the 1DX, the big dog Canon. When can they use that um, with the um, B1? And the answer is it's on the way. So there's a firmware that's being released um, as time progresses. So I don't want to say it's on the way as in tomorrow. Um, there's a schedule that's being worked out. So before Profoto releases anything, they have to test and test and test and make sure it's 100% perfect. And so um, the estimate right now is about two to three months before that's ready. So between two and three months, and you should have that. Okay, um, I'm just going to check to make sure we don't have any other questions. And it looks like we don't. And so um, I want to thank everybody. So Lex, you can come in now. What a sport. I had her just standing in the horrible, most horrible sun ever. I don't know how you're not crying. And Morgan, um, Morgan is awesome. He... Uh, he never knows what I'm going to throw at him. I'm just like, grab the thing. 
<laughs> one thing. So thanks, Morgan, for doing all that stuff. There are some things that I want to make sure that um, you're aware of. Don't forget that you can go to profoto.com slash B1, and what you'll see is the, um, the, all the stuff that we talked about in the last webinar. You can find that there, all the information about the B1. There's a frequently asked questions about the B1. You can see where dealers are, everything. All things B1 can be found there, and so make sure you zip over there and see that. Also, profoto.com slash webinar. This is just one in a series of webinars that's coming. We did one last uh, month in the studio where we walked through all the features. And so some of the stuff I skipped today about how to control the B1 and all that uh, flash exposure compensation that I just sort of did, you can see that in detail in the last months. And we're doing one again next month. Matt, do you have a lower third? Yes, February 19th. We're doing another webinar um, with Profoto, and it's going to be more of uh, light shaping and some control and some, some different stuff than we did today, not the on-location balancing stuff. But we're going to be doing more of that. And there's some exciting stuff that I can't really tell you about with the webinars that are going to be coming up in about a month or two. Sorry, I'm kicking you. Um, and so that's going to be happening there. So without further ado, I want to just make sure I got everybody's questions here. Yep, I got them all. So without further ado, I just want to say thanks for joining us. Thanks to you guys for your help. And don't forget to join us February 19th for our next webinar. We'll see you then.